friends, I'm Pastor Jonathan Perry. And like all of you, I watched with heartbreak the events of the past weeks in our nation's capital and hallowed halls as the forces of falsehood, conspiracy, white supremacy, force swelled to violence and to tragedy. It was unbelievable, yet in some way foreseeable. And my utter heartbreak led me to prayer, as I know it did for all of you. In the New Horizons Sunday School class this week, the prayers lifted up were these. Prayers for our nation in the aftermath of the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol building last week. Prayers for those injured and the families of those who lost their lives. Prayers for a peaceful and smooth transition in our government as we approach the presidential inauguration next week. And prayers for a better future ahead. And on the way to church, on Frenchies, orange trucks, in big letters, it said, pray for peace. And I did. We all do. We pray for peace. Lord, hear our prayers. This week, I've also been reflecting about how we're called to put those prayers into action, to pray with our hearts and pray with our feet. How we, as followers of the way of Jesus in this time, our time, are called to the work of moral courage, of truth and reconciliation, of peace and justice, of faith and hope and love. There's much work to do, but it is our sacred calling. And God is with us and for us and before us. This week, as we remember the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the ongoing work for civil rights, I thought of John Lewis, who marched with King as a student who led in his Ebenezer Baptist Church and who served our nation for six decades with moral courage. So I thought of him because before the events of January 6th, the last public event in the Capitol Rotunda was the lying in state of Congressman John Lewis. And I like to think that on that day, and even now, his words reverberating in the rotunda, bearing witness to our better angels. And so on this day, I want to share with you his last words written to us. John Lewis writes this, I have long believed and I have long preached that our nation's moral compass comes from God. It is of God. It is seen through God. Ours is a sacred struggle. There are forces today in America trying to divide people. There are forces today that are still preaching hate and division. There are forces today who want us to return to the old ways. It makes me sad for we don't want to go back. We want to go forward and create one community, one America. The journey begins with faith, faith in the dignity and worth of every human being. This is an idea with roots in Scripture and in the canon of America, in Genesis and in the Declaration of Independence. The journey is sustained by the persistence, persistence in the pressing of the justice of the cause. And the journey is informed by hope. Hope that someday, in some way, our restless souls will bring heaven and earth together and God will wipe away every tear that adversity can breed unity, that hatred can give way to love. And in John Lewis's final written words, he insisted, you have to believe that. You have to believe that. And I do. I believe that with all I am. And so may we put feet to our beliefs and to our prayers. And together in the grace of God, may we rise from this moment to live out the true meaning of our creed. Friends, join me in praying. God of all people, nations, races, we come to you in fervent prayer. Prayer for peace, prayer for justice, for righteousness, and for your healing and reconciliation and unity that follows after. We pray for our nation, for the coming inauguration and administration, and for all those charged as servants of our nation and its people. We pray for those who cross dividing lines, for understanding, for compassion, for healing, for growth. And we pray in confession for the lingering sins of racism, hatred, bitterness, falsehood, and division. 
for the ways that we have been silent or complicit or complacent for too long. But we ask now that your grace might transform us, heal us, and lead us on that we might have persistence in the work of justice, that we might have hope for your will be done, and that we might have your love to lead us through together and find unity on the other side. May we believe that. May we live it, and may it be so. In the name of the Prince of Peace, the God of love, and the Spirit that transforms us and unites us. Amen. Welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church of Denton. We're glad you've decided to join in fellowship with our community today. A reminder that you can find the worship bulletin, hymns, and a place to register your attendance on our website at fumcdenton.com live. If you're worshiping via Facebook, please say hello, offer your own prayer request, and join in the conversation in the comments. As we worship, please join me in our opening responses. The world belongs to God, the earth and all its people. How good it is, how wonderful to live together in unity. Love and faith come together, justice and peace join hands. If Christ's disciples keep silent, stones would shout aloud. Open our lips, O God, 
and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, whatever your story or identity, God's grace is here for you, and so are we. Let us continue in our worship together. God, seeker of the lost, draw your children back to your loving embrace, refresh us and restore us to our inheritance as your people and reconcile our hearts to you, that we may become ambassadors of your reconciling love to all the world. Through Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. I bet you all have some of these laying around your house somewhere. I'm going to attempt to put this together. <laughs> As you can see, this structure is made up of a few pieces. 
without God and without each other, we are like the little pieces of this figure. We certainly have value because we are wonderful pieces, but we're not complete and whole until we join with the others. We're so much stronger when we're together. That's kind of like what being in a church is like. We're a bunch of pieces or people that have value, but we really become something special and complete when we're a whole church together. Even if we're not in the same physical space right now, we're still part of the same church family. We have the opportunity to be together in different ways. For instance, some of the offerings we have are book clubs, Sunday school take-home or drop-off activities, our hot cocoa and chat, and more. Will you pray with me? God of all things, in you we are made whole. Help us to remember that we are stronger when we're together. Amen. Remember, you are a blessing. Have a great week. Hi, church family and friends. I'm Pastor Don. When you've studied scripture as long as I have, you learn context is everything. We tend to forget that most of the New Testament books are actually letters written to local churches. The focus of Paul's many letters is not primarily on how to be Christian. Rather, the focus of Paul's many letters is on how to be the church, the body of Christ in the world. As Paul writes in Romans 12, 5, so we who are many are one body in Christ. One of the lessons of this pandemic, we are learning what it means to be the church. You know, like the old finger play. This is the church, this is the steeple, open it up and see all the people. We are learning to be the church when our multiple worship spaces and buildings are actually closed. In fact, we are learning that important, even vital ministry can and does happen outside the walls of our buildings. We're learning that when life gives you lemons, squeeze. When you read through the Gospels, it's clear that Jesus is intimately concerned about the church that he's birthed into existence. In S.D. Gordon's book, Quiet Talks on Service, the author gives an imaginary account of Jesus' return to heaven. It goes something like this. When Jesus ascends, he's greeted by angels who begin to inquire about his work on earth. Jesus tells them about his birth, life, teaching, death, and resurrection and how he accomplished the salvation of the world. The angel Gabriel asks, well, now that you're back in heaven, who will continue your work on earth? And Jesus said, well, while I was on earth, I gathered a small group of people around me who believed in me and loved me. They'll continue to spread the gospel and to carry on the work of the church. But Gabriel is perplexed. You mean those who denied knowing you and who ran away when you were arrested and later crucified? Yes, says Jesus. But suppose their faith fails. Suppose they get too consumed with life, their cares and their worries, and they fail to tell your story. What then? And Jesus replies, I have no other plan. Now, I'd like to annotate this story with Jesus saying, then Mom, Mary, and Martha will get her done. <laughs> Our scripture readings are John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23, and Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. John 10, 17 through 23. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Hebrews 12, 1-2 Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, 
and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. So there's a story about two spies who parachute across enemy lines, only to be immediately surrounded, rifles readied. As the order is given, ready, aim, one spy turns to the other and says, listen, I've got a plan. That's either crazy, irrational optimism or MacGyver armed with a paper clip. Most of us have no training wheels for what we've experienced over the last year. A global pandemic, repeated natural disasters, a huge racial divide, and a highly divisive election all balled up into a bitter pill to swallow. And yet, when Jesus prays for his church in verse 20, he does so knowing that his disciples have their work cut out for them. And so he prays for his church's well-being, asking God to work among his disciples, renewing their relationships with one another, creating a oneness, not necessarily of mind, but of heart. Just as the Apostle Paul claims that we've been given a ministry of refreshment, how do you refresh our church? First, reclaim. If we are going to refresh our church, we need to reclaim our identity as the body of Christ, this great cloud of witnesses. The world needs to see small groups of Christians actively involved in the community they pray for. The point is not that we all vote the same or even believe exactly the same. That's the beauty of a diverse God in whose image we've all been made. It's about a oneness of heart, not single-mindedness. When learning to love God with all your heart, our differences do not become a point of separation, but celebration. Our stated vision as a church is to shine God's light into every life the operative word being every, Ex exactly because of our diversity that makes this possible. I mean, there are some people you will never be able to reach with the message of God's love in Jesus, but others can and will. Oneness of heart is critical to our message. Why? So that the world may believe that God has sent you, claims Jesus. As we walk in the everyday rhythms of the communities we belong to, we must intentionally bring Christ to them. While the current pandemic makes volunteering and social gathering difficult, practicing the art of the squeeze requires that we use every opportunity, every Zoom, every text, every tweet, email, Facebook post, phone call, and six foot plus interaction as a chance to incarnate God's love in Jesus Christ. We don't say, come and see Jesus at my church. Instead, we bring Jesus and his church to our communities. Some of our members who volunteer with First Mill, our ministry to the homeless, recently asked what housing resources are available for the homeless. I was moved by their inquiries to help our homeless find shelter, especially in these cold winter months. Clearly, this is a step beyond providing meals and prayers. Embodying Christ means going the extra mile to help those in need. And I know this church has a, is a big financial support of our daily bread, uh, Giving Hope, uh, Denton Community Food Room, Interfaith Ministries, Monsignor King, and the Salvation Army, giving tens of thousands of dollars collectively. We do this because these agencies are better equipped to assist those in need. We also have members who volunteer with these ministries. And I want to encourage all of us to think about how we can engage our communities in 2021. Consider where you can plug in when it's safe to do so. And in the process, reclaim your identity as the body of Christ, this great cloud of witnesses. Secondly, recommit. If we are going to refresh our church, we need to recommit to caring for one another. The gaslighting going on in society today is deeply troubling and cannot be tolerated in the church. It's not 
becoming of who we are as Jesus' disciples or the God we serve. We are called to a higher purpose, to embody the love of Jesus Christ. And the inability to be in relationship with those different from us discredits the message we've been entrusted with, God's love for all people, a message that I believe is both timeless and universal. When members of our church and our staff learned that there were people with genuine need in our faith community, you generously made sure that they would not go without over the Christmas holiday, providing gift cards, food, and even Christmas gifts. This church has also provided Christmas gifts for all of the 200 angels on our angel tree. Thank you for thinking about others and not just those in your own bubble. We are learning the virus attacks the most vulnerable among us, disproportionately affecting the elderly, those with pre-existing conditions, minorities, those lacking good medical care, and the poor. We have got to work together to address the inequities in our society because if the church isn't a compassionate force for good, for the benefit of all people, we are not being the church. Jesus spent a disproportionate percentage of his ministry with those I just mentioned, and it stands to reason, so should we. Good neighbors show up when there's a real need. It's time to get your neighbor on. FUMC Denton, recommit yourself to being the church in 2021. And finally, celebrate. Celebrate. If we're going to refresh our church, we need to engage in celebration. In a previous sermon, I spoke about going to Presbyterian Denton to celebrate its workers, bringing donuts, handwritten notes, cards, uh, signs from our youth, our children, our adults. Uh, several of us stood by the hospital door during a staff change, greeting medical workers with applause and verbiage like, thank you for being our heroes. The chaplain told us that she witnessed more than one medical worker become emotional when they saw the free donuts that we provided. You know that you are in need of celebration when donuts move you. By way of follow-up, I received the following email from the chaplain. I just wanted to say how much everyone appreciated the donuts, really. And the signs are still welcoming people as they come in. But perhaps what stands out is hearing you cheer people on as they arrive and left work. Several people had tears in their eyes as they really needed that moment of encouragement. So thank you from my heart. Please know your kindness really made a big difference. What this doesn't tell you is how good it felt to be on the giving end of this celebration. When we celebrate, even if its target is someone else, it does something to you. I believe it invites joy into your heart and life. Celebration is good for the soul. I mean, we have so much to celebrate as a church, despite this dystopian movie that we've been stuck in over the last 10 months. We ended the year in the black. We managed to do church despite closing our sanctuary in multiple worship spaces. We are now fully staffed. We've continued our multiple partnerships with locally and global missions, and even increased our commitments there. We've baptized, had members join. We've even continued to support over 150 homebound members with calls, cards, and prayers. While we are still working at it, our streamed services are to be celebrated. We've offered live worship on All Saints and the season of Advent with no known spread of COVID-19. And while we're taking a breather on live worship after the numbers spiked, our hope is to begin live worship again by Lent. Jesus claims in verse 22, we have been given God's doxa, God's glory, splendor, brightness. If that's not reason enough to celebrate, I don't know what is. Reclaim. If we're going to refresh our church, we need to reclaim our identity as the body of Christ in the world. Recommit. If we're going to refresh our church, we need to recommit ourselves to caring for one another. Gaslighting has no place among Jesus' disciples. And celebrate. If we're going to refresh FUMC Denton, we need to engage in celebration of what God has done and is doing in all our lives. Reclaim, recommit, and celebrate. 
So let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Your homework, write a card or a note to a medical worker celebrating their sacrifice during this time of pandemic. Get it to us by the end of the week and we'll make sure it gets there. Please pray with me. Precious Jesus, we are not only learning what it means to be Christian, we are learning what it means to be your church. Nurture in us the desire and will to reclaim, recommit, and celebrate so that your church may be refreshed and renewed in its vision to shine your light and love into every life. Amen. Let us join in prayer. Together responding, hear our prayer. Lord God, we give thanks that because we are made in your image, it is possible for us to be united. We thank you for the unity we find as a church in our Lord Jesus Christ, and pray that you might forgive the sin that disrupts the unity you intend for all of humanity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for a growth of understanding between Christians of different outlooks and traditions. May we learn from them and them from us, and may we experience unity as we grow together in truth and love. Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our own church, that we and all its members and friends might be filled with the spirit of faith, hope, and love, so that we might share the good news of the gospel. Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the local community of which we are a part and for our country. May we seek greater understanding between the young and those who are older, between employers and those they employ, between migrants and their host communities, between leaders and those they represent, and between the church and those for whom the church is a place of pain. Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, we pray for the unity of the world, for reconciliation, peace and compassion between rich and poor, white and non-white, capitalist and communist, and those nations which have long been embattled one against the other. Lord of mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, you said to your apostles, peace I give you, my peace I leave with you. Hear now the prayers of your faithful church and grant to us the peace and unity we so desperately need. We pray this in the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. Thanks to your generosity, FUMC is at work in our local community and throughout the world. Your offerings make our work possible. The worship we share each week, Bible studies, Sunday school classes, mission partnerships, first meal, care and nurture from cradle to grave are supported by your financial tithes and gifts. I hope you'll consider making a gift today either through the giving page online at fumcdenton.com give or by texting the number found on your screen. As people of the new creation, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God.
Good morning, church. I'm Josh Taylor, and I'd like to share some upcoming opportunities to connect here at First United Methodist Church. Members of our church, in partnership with our staff, have begun a Combating Racism Task Force to help us consider issues around racism and ways that we might combat racism in our world today. Beginning January 21st, you are invited to the very first gathering sponsored by this group. Pastor David Finley and members of the task force will be leading all of our worshiping communities through a four-week program on Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. We will cover topics like what is systemic racism and how to be an ally. This will be an important opportunity for us to begin a conversation as a church family on how we can shine God's love into every life even more intentionally. We hope you'll join us. As always, if you'd like to learn more about who we are and what's going on in the life of our church, please visit us online at fumcdenton.com beliefs. And if you're interested in becoming a member, we invite you to visit fumcdenton.com membership. And now please join us in our closing song. Receive this blessing. As we run with perseverance the race set before us, let us reclaim, recommit, and celebrate together, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. Let us be people of one heart, even as we celebrate our difference and diversity. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. <laughs>